Can, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Deal. Good deal. Uh, this morning, Dr. David Dahlgren is joining us from Utah State University. Uh, Dr. Dahlgren is an extension associate who earned his master's degree and his PhD from Utah State University, working on the Parker Mountain population of uh, sage grouse over there, and, and most recently spent some time over in Prairie Chicken Country with Kansas Wildlife Parks and Tourism um, in Hayes, Kansas, as a small game specialist over there, and has since returned to Utah State University, as I mentioned, as an extension associate. So we're super fortunate to have Dave um, on the line this morning, and um, good timing. This co uh, correlates pretty well with the recent release of a Science to Solution SGI publication that came out in January, and hopefully folks have seen that. that that's entitled The uh, Grazing and Sagebrush Treatment 25-Year Case Study in Utah, and that link was included in uh, most of the whole the dates and also the call-in information that was sent out, so you all should have access to that. And it is also posted on the SGI uh, Science of the Solutions page. So um, today we're going to uh, cover sage grouse and sage brush management, and often this is a topic that probably generates a lot more questions than it does answers. Uh, but certainly I think something that is applicable range-wide and, and I think uh, warrants um, as much discussion as we can really uh, give it. So. Um, Dave's going to run through a presentation today, and then we're also going to open it up for questions. Um, so I'd encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to pick Dave's brain on the topic. And um, probably the easiest way to do that is to, uh, in the webinar, maybe write your questions down in, in, in the chat, and we can go through those one at a time. And uh, if you don't do that, we can uh, uh, also just reconvene here on the telephone line and ask questions as they, as they come up here when Dave's done with his presentation. So just real quick, uh, housekeeping, um, if you'd please mute your phone, that would be really good. And um, just keep an eye out for future uh, webinars. That schedule should be out and about, and I believe we have a staff call coming up in March um, for folks involved with the FGI SWAT. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Dave, thanks so much for joining us this morning, and uh, hopefully this, this will be a, a good deal and informative and, again, encourage encourage some discussion here. So put your taking caps on, folks. And, and uh, don't be shy to participate. Thanks, Dave. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? You're all muted, so you can't answer. I got... We can hear you. Hey, um, okay, thanks. Um, so I, I need to acknowledge a, a couple other folks, Eric, Dr. Eric Backer and Dr. Terry Mesmer, that I work with in, in the Utah uh, Community-Based Conservation Program. Um, they're integral part of, of some of the things we're going to be talking about today. Um, just as an outline for uh, what we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll kind of talk about an overview of the issue. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions that uh, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here as far as your knowledge of sage grouse, but we'll kind of hit some basics. Um, I'm going to go over two different uh, research projects today, and, and there's a lot of information here, uh, so we'll, we'll try to get through it quickly, but I, I think there's some important things that we've learned about uh, stage first treatment in grouse from these two projects. And then uh, we'll kind of talk about some general principles and, uh, and then hopefully have some time for questions. So um, I, I, do, I do want to have some discussion. There's, there's so much about this topic that um, we... Uh, like was mentioned before, there's more questions than answers and, and a lot of very prescriptive ways of thinking about things. So, uh, first of all, sage grouse and sage brush. Uh, sage grouse and sage brush. These are, as everybody knows, obligate um, to the sage brush system. And they, uh, sage grouse need sage brush. So when we consider winter, you know, we're talking 99.9% .9 of the diet in the winter is sagebrush. In the breeding, uh, uh, for nesting, I mean, the research is explicit that the nests under sage are the most uh, productive and, uh, and, and used during the early brooding. And then in the late brooding, that's, that's the one place where sagebrush um, cover becomes less important. And I think it's the place where we have the most room to uh, discuss sagebrush treatment and removal 
um, especially in, in conjunction with benefiting livestock operations, which I'm going to assume is what most of you are dealing with, uh, producers, and, and certainly what I deal with um, as, as part of my job. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the ecology of safer systems and, and, and what we know. I'm not going to I'm not going to go over everything that would take too long, but there's this idea that, as you can see on the picture on the left, you have lower sagebrush cover, you have more grass and forb cover, uh, more herbaceous. And uh, the, the photo on the right, you have more sagebrush cover uh, than you have less of the herbaceous. And, and this is a, um, a competition thing, right, a competition thing uh, for resources, and this idea of, of sagebrush system leads us to the idea that if we if we remove the, the sagebrush cover we get more uh, forb and grass cover and as I deal with producers and I'm certain as all of you deal with producers this is their prevailing philosophy when it comes to sagebrush uh, landscapes um, certainly there's exceptions to that but most of the producers I work with have this view and and it's not wholly wrong, uh, we have uh, research that supports this view, that, and, and I'm going to report some of that today. So um, it's, it, it's certainly part of the picture. However, if you look at this picture on the left, um, here is a, a sagebrush where you have the interspaces or bare ground, and your forb and grasses are associated with your sagebrush cover. And we do see this as well. Um, there's a, a great little publication, if you want to get your hands on it, from uh, Extension here at USU, uh, Should Ranchers Value Sagebrush and Why We Need Sagebrush. And, and it talks about some of this research that has shown this hydraulic lift that sagebrush can have in that soil profile and, and bring the, the soil moisture to the forbs and grasses uh, and their root system uh, and, and access some of that deeper soil, soil moisture. And so this is a, a facultative uh, uh, play that the, the sagebrush has in the system. And so this is also part of the picture, and, and we need to be thinking about it. But the point here is sagebrush systems are more complicated. Like every ecological system I've ever looked into, it's more complicated than it is simple. And there's lots of relationships going on and lots of dependent factors. Are you in a high elevation area with deep soils um, with more resources or maybe more competition versus a dry site, a drier site with shallower soil okay. where, okay. where sagebrush may be um, uh, actually facilitating your herbaceous. So it, it's something to, to consider as, as, as you move forward. Um, and as we deal with agencies, and, and as I've heard from the NRCS, as I work with them here in Utah, um, really sagebrush treatments are a no-no right now in, in the sage grouse world. Um, most states have, I think Utah is a little bit behind on that. We, we were treating more sagebrush the last uh, few years than most other states. Um, but recently, and I just wanted to use this as an example, our Utah governor put out an executive order on sage grouse last year uh, prior to the listing decision. And one of the items in that order uh, has this wording, no state funding shall be approved for projects that materially eliminate sagebrush within SGMAs, which is our, our term for our priority areas, without consulting the Division of Wildlife Resources and a finding that such a project will have a net conservation gain for the species. And I think that last part is the most important part. How do we ensure a net conservation gain for the species if we're going to remove sagebrush for a sagebrush obligate? Um, this, this, is the, this is the crux of it all. And hopefully we can, we can talk a little bit and come to some conclusion about that. Um, so I'm going to start on Parker Mountain in south central Utah. You can see the, the inset there. Uh, we're, we're down there kind of in the Capitol Reef, if you've been to Capitol Reef or Fish Lake area. Um, the, the yellow outline is the border of 
of what I would call the Parker Mountain study area that we, we've been looking at. We have about 10 years of research down there. You're talking about, you know, almost probably almost 300,000 acres of uh, pro predominantly sagebrush. Um, the, just so you understand the area a little bit, the elevation moves from east to west. So it moves up in elevation east to west on this high elevation plateau, and then again from north to south. So you're moving from about 7,000 feet up to about 10,000 feet um, elevation. Everything west of that study area is Great Basin, and the study area and everything to the east is uh, in the Colorado Plateau. This is a sagebrush semi-desert down there, so um, we're, we're dealing with a lot more shrub cover and less herbaceous cover. And we're, the experiment and, and stuff I'm going to talk about is predominantly happening in mountain big sage brush communities with um, some black sage on the hilltops, uh, but we really focused in on the black on the uh, mountain big sage. And and we're talking in, in that 9,500 to 10,000 foot range. So we're we're up high, and we, we get quite a bit of moisture uh, on on the place where we're going to be working and talking about here. So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about our experimental design. We really used this adaptive management approach where we started small and then we went bigger. So the little turquoise boxes are 100 acre plots that were put into a pasture and um, those plots were randomly assigned treatment type. So they either were treated with um, a Dixie Harrow, a two-way treatment, a loss aerator. Uh, Tebby Thyron uh, or Spike or, or left control. So we had four replicates of each of those treatment types for control in, in, that, uh, in those 16 plots. Okay? And then based on the results of that experiment, which started in 2000, uh, and, and we actually we published uh, that kind of the short term, the first few years post-treatment, we published in the Wildlife Society Bolton in 2006. So we moved from there based on those results, and, and we started management at a little bit higher elevation pastures. And you can see those, those pastures delineated there. We kind of started on the south uh, at the end of this, so the green polygons, that's called south pasture. And then we moved north um, every year, a few years, and you can kind of see how uh, those years are, are of treatment are, are interspersed. The yellow are our reference areas. So those are untreated sagebrush stands, mountain big sagebrush stands, in those same pastures. Okay, and so those were used for our control. Um, so we, we did vegetation sampling randomly across our plots and across our pastures. We looked at shrub, grass, and forb cover. I'm not going to go into all the, the experimental design details that would take too long. Um, but we also looked at sage grouse use across these areas. So for the, for the Parker Lake pasture, which is our 100 acres plot, we looked at pellet counts in 2003 and 2004. And then we did uh, pointing dog surveys in those areas from 2003 to 2009. And then we've also done pointing dog surveys in 2014 and 15 in the bigger areas, uh, both in the treated and untreated areas. And I'm, I'm going to show you some of that data. Uh, the last part that I want to talk about is in our bigger pastures, those, those higher elevation pastures, we did, um, uh, we did clipping and weighing along transects. So we have forb and grass biomass, so basically forage, and we looked at shrub uh, canopy cover uh, in, those, in those areas, both in, again, both in treated and untreated areas. So these are some of our results. So I'm going to I'm going to first address the Parker Lake pasture, our basic our 100 acre plot, and kind of talk about that. And we're going to talk about the long term. This is data that a, a graduate student uh, just got done analyzing. So in, in the top, this is shrub cover data, uh, percent data on the on the uh, y axis, and you can see control in the top left. And then we kept that control um, data going through the, the other compared to the other treatment types. So you can see shrub cover was reduced uh, that first year um, post-treatment for Dixie Harrow, and then kind of started coming back, um, and, it, and it, it got close. And based on my experience of being there, you pretty much can't tell the difference anymore 
between where uh, the Dixie Harrow was and, uh, and where it wasn't. And you can see at the picture in the, the very top right, that's, that's the Dixie Harrow plot. Uh, that's an example of one that was treated. Uh, that's, that's the first summer post-treatment. So it, it, it basically went down to dirt. Uh, although we did leave, and this is important to know, we did leave intact stage brush, both islands and uh, larger areas nearby, you can see at the top of there. Um, loss and aerator, uh, the shrub cover, basically within about five, six years, the shrub cover came back to control levels. Uh, it responded really uh, quick, the, the shrub cover re, uh, came back really quickly. The middle picture is a, an example of a, a loss and aerator treatment. It basically crushes the sagebrush and, uh, and it, it, Parker Mountain is, is very rocky. We actually, um, in, in, in one treatment time of doing this, we ruined the Division of Wildlife's loss narrator. It, it, uh, there was lots of rocks out there, and it, it, it banged it up pretty good. Um, for the spikes, and, and you can see the, the Teddy Thyron data in the bottom right, um, the shrub cover uh, was reduced and then hasn't come back still. So the, the spike has a much longer lasting treatment effect. Uh, you can see the bottom right picture. The spike had more of a feathered treatment effect. And, and what I mean by that is one plant lived, one plant died, another partial plant died but lived, and, and then other plants just weren't even affected by the treatment. And so it, it really had this, this feathered mosaic effect. And that's what we were going for. The, the spike treatment was put on at a 0.3 active ingredient per acre. It was it was lower. We weren't out there to just decimate sagebrush. We really wanted this this feathered effect going on. And that I'm going to talk more about that here in a minute. This is the percent grass cover, and you can see control. And this is the same pattern. It's going to be this this pattern of grass as we move in the future. So we, we had a little bit of grass response from Dixie right away, and then it kind of went away. Um, Lawson took a little bit longer and then went away. Um, and, and we really haven't seen uh, a separation of grass from control with Lawson. Uh, the spiked areas, uh, it took a little while, and then you see a, a response of grass a little bit later. And it it's stayed that way. Um, we, we actually have some data um, from 2014, and it's still different. Um, I just didn't report it here because it, it, it doesn't quite come all together, so we're, we're just going to 2009. So this is forb cover now. Uh, so Dixie, not really a response from forb cover. Lawson, not really a response from forb cover. But the spikes, we saw a response from forb cover. There was kind of an initial spike, and then it's it's gone on and, and, and kind of stayed apart um, uh, since uh, almost gone in a, a different direction than the control. And um, what's, what's interesting about the form response of the Teddy Thyron is, is that we started to um, break it down a little bit more than just forms. So this is the what we call them the facultative forms, or, or, or more of the succulent forms, these wetter forms. And uh, so we pulled those out of our data and just look at, at the response of, of these more facultative uh, forms, and what you can see is uh, not much in Dixie, not much in Lawson, but a, a, a stronger response in the Tevi Thyron. And, and what, what we think is going on here is, is when you do a spike treatment, you're still left with a skeleton of a sagebrush, and that skeleton is able to hold snow cover, provide shade. Um, it basically creates this more mesic um, microclimate. And, and that definitely affected the forbs. And so when we looked at these forbs um, across treatment types, the, the purple is more of the upland drier forbs, and the green and the kind of the blue-green, um, those are more of the wetter forbs. And you can see that the spike uh, just had a lot more of these wetter forbs. It, it, it really is evidence that, that those microclimates those wetter, more mesic microclimates were being uh, created through that spike treatment. Um, even more interesting, we went back to the the sagebrush or sage grouse literature and looked at all the different form species that's reported to be used by sage grouse, and these are mostly uh, crop analysis, so diet analysis, 
And when we looked at those forms, you can see the Dixie seemed to, it never fully separated from control, but was above control most of the years. Lawson, not much there. But uh, the spike plots, those sprouts forms separated early and stayed apart um, the whole time. And what's, what's interesting about this is when we look at our sage grouse use data, we get that same exact pattern. So this is um, pellet count. These are densities based on distance sampling on random transects. And you can see that our Dixies were higher than our loss or control, but not statistically different in density. But our spikes were statistically different from all of them. And there was just a lot more grouse using these um, spike uh, plots, these 100-acre plots. When we looked at our bird dog data, same story, um, just a lot more grouse. And I didn't, I don't have the graph up, but a lot more brood using our our spike uh, plot. Um, also, when we looked at our pellet, um, and, and we we measured we, we measured distance to edge, so either edge of a treatment or uh, edge of a, a change in sagebrush uh, type, like from black sage to big sage. And uh, most of those pellets were within 30 meters, kind of. If you, if you took on the whole, they would be within 60 meters of an edge. And that, that was not only pellets found in treatment areas, but pellets found in impact stage brush, they were within about 60 meters uh, uh, of an edge, and most of them within about 30 meters of an edge. So while they liked those treatment areas, they still wanted that shrub cover nearby. And so that, that's so important to how we design treatment uh, for sage trout, okay? So that's kind of the what we conclusion we came to from that Parker Lake data, Parker Lake pasture data, and then because spike was the most successful for the grouse and, and vegetation, we then started treating uh, pastures a little bit higher in elevation, the same mountain big sagebrush areas, um, and, and, and just in different years now, okay? So the data I'm going to go through now is, is not as much in an experimental design, but is more of an evalu evaluation of that management action. So we we did uh, we took all our vegetation data. So this is this is shrub cover, both live and dead, and form and grass biomass. So we're not talking about form and grass cover now. We're talking about biomass. And we did a, P a PCA, which is a principal component analysis. And when we looked at the PCA, the red is the untreated transects, the black are the treated transects. So you can see they, they kind of partition out together. And when we look at the different pieces of data, basically the live shrub cover is associating with the untreated transects, and the dead shrub cover is associating with the, with the treated transects, as well as an increase in forb and grass cover. So when we, when we took a look across all the pastures and combined all that data, what we found was that there was a definitely a response in forb and grass biomass in the treated uh, areas. Okay, so that's kind of looking at all the pastures together. When we looked at the pastures each individually, um, so the the lighter orange is uh, forb biomass in treated transects, and the darker orange is forb biomass in untreated, and in all cases the treated had more for biomass than the untreated transit. However, none of them were significantly different uh, statistically. When we looked at the grass biomass for forage, we had the same pattern, except now we had uh, statistical significance in mix for shea and chicken springs pastures. What's interesting about this is Butte's pasture and South pasture were our shallowest soils, whereas Nix, Porsche, and Chicken Spring have much deeper soil profiles. And that's where we were getting the most bang for our buck, was where we had those, those deeper soil, soil profiles. That's important when we're talking with producers and we're trying to mix grouse projects with livestock projects. And and, and how they come together. It, it, those deeper soils allowed that um, that bigger bang for our buck. When we looked at, at 
dog surveys in these bigger pastures. Um, we 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 did we did so in 2014 and 15, and you can see both years here. And there were some variants by year how the grouse were using these pastures, especially in Butte. The first year there wasn't many grouse in 2014, but it had the most in 2015. Okay, um, Nix kind of had the opposite pattern. It's important to note though that Butte and Nix pasture are right next to each other. So these, these birds are using this landscape. Um, but when we looked at all those treatment areas in the pastures compared to our reference areas that were untreated, by far more grouse were using our treated areas. And again, more broods were as well. So our data is showing us that the, the grouse are, are preferring these, these spike treatments. Um, and again, we use that same active ingredient so we were, we were trying to get this feathered effect just at a, a bigger scale. And, and this is the data, how the grouse are responding to that. So what do we learn from, from Parker Mountain, if I, can, if I can sum it up here? Spike was, uh, when we compared it to our mechanical treatments, outperformed it both uh, in the vegetation and, and grouse use. Um, this, this feathered effect, this Partial kill, um, I can't overemphasize that enough. When, when you have large treatment with 100% um, kill, you're, you're, you're on the edge of, of hurting the grouse um, and hurting this. It, it, it's this prescription of feathered effect that, and the small treatments that are going to be um, what help the grouse. And, I, I like to think about it like this. So I, my grandma, she used to make chocolate chip cookies, and we call them chocolate chip surprise. And the reason we call them that was you were surprised when you found the chocolate chip. And that's kind of the, the principle that I would say, if you're going to do sagebrush treatment for drought, it, it, it's a little bit here and a little bit there. It, it's not big block of... of of treatment that's going to help. Okay, um, this the spike helped create this mesic microclimate. We got more succulent forbs and more forbs that grouse prefer. Um, the the spike areas were preferred by grouse and specifically by broods. We increased forage. Uh, the, again, the deeper soils we had our bank for our buck. and and this management, this adaptive management process. If you can do it and go through that learning process. What happened on Parker is the producers went with us through this process and, and, and have buy-in to the, to the learning process. And that, that made a big difference in how that, that project and how that group is currently looking at future management. And lastly, again, late brood rearing habitat is the place that if stage source treatment is going to be good for grouse. This is where it's going to be. It's going to be in your late brooding habitat. The, the issue here is on Parker Mountain, the broods are moving up in elevation and they're summering up at these highest elevations while they lack at our lowest elevations and kind of nest in the middle. We, we do have nesting in these higher areas, but not as much as that middle area. And so because of that seasonal movement that this population goes through, we're able to, to do some of these treatments and say that we're targeting late brooding habitat. If our birds were using this area where these plots are um, for lecking and nesting and wintering, because a lot, there's lots of populations out there that use the same area for all these seasonal habitat types, our opportunity to be successful and help grouse with treatments would diminish. If, if they were using these habitats um, for all their seasonal habitat needs. So you really need to know that about your population and understand how your treatments are fitting into these different seasonal habitats. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm going to move on to Deseret. And so this, this has to do with that Science to Solution publication that, that just came out. Um, and we'll kind of go, go through this. Um, and, and, and this is kind of at a bigger scale than where we were, what we were working on Parker. So this is in northern Utah. You can see the outline of the ranch there. That's about a 260,000-acre ranch. 
Um, the BLN is the, is the brown or tan, uh, and you can see some BLN inholdings on the eastern side of the ranch, and then the BLN land to the north in Utah. Um, I did not have the, the land ownership for Wyoming, but it's very similar to the north side where there's lots of BLN there uh, on the Wyoming side of that line. So um, this is not semi-desert. This is Wyoming Basin. It has a lot more grass and forb cover than when, where we were working down on Parker. So you can see this, this picture on the left. Uh, we're looking uh, at, from 19, at data from 1989 to 2013. These are the LECs. Um, in the area, and we separate them into kind of three different study areas. So there's there's the ridge, which is that north north of the, the ranch in the circles, and and that's what we're calling the ridge study area. The western Wyoming is there. It's all the triangles, and then Deseret are the boxes. And so we, we separate them out like this. And what we basically said is we're going to look at these as, as three distinct breeding populations. Okay. Now, we understand that these three po breeding populations are connected. Uh, certainly during the winter, they're connected, um, and, and probably the same wintering population. But um, for the breeding, uh, we kind of separate them like that uh, once we hit that lecking season. So our approach was to look at the big picture lek counts and compare them across this landscape, then to look closer at brood count, and then to look at um, so Deseret had some treatments that took place, and so we want to look at sage-grouse use within those treatments. Um, again, this is a case study. This is not a strong experimental design. Um, it would be hard to implement such a design at this landscape level, and so we wanted to learn what we could learn through this case study. So the differences in management, DLL had high-intensity, low-duration grazing. It allowed them to rest about 30% of their pastures. And when they rested the pasture, they often got two full growing seasons based on their, their next rotation coming back in once it was rested. That rest is, is critical, I think, to these sage systems. For rich and, and western Wyoming, we had either season-long or simple rotation grazing. For stocking rate, DLL had about half the stocking rate as rich or western Wyoming. Um, for DOL, about five, through this time period, about 15% of the sage-grouse habitat had been treated. Um, it averaged to about 1.5% of the habitat being treated per year. So there was, there was kind of a regular treatment schedule on DOL within their sage-grouse system. It's important to know DOL is not a sage-grouse ranch. <laughs> it's a livestock ranch. Uh, with wildlife, um, a wildlife program, uh, they 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 do a lot of elk hunting. That's their main uh, revenue for wildlife. For Rich County, uh, there was less than two percent of that area that was treated, and for West Wyoming, about eight percent of the area. Now, when I when we say treated, we include wildfire, and that's what made up most of that eight percent for West Wyoming. Wyoming was two big wildfires. So when we looked at let count, at the first part of our period, um, all three populations are kind of trending together. And then um, in about 1995, it started, after that, it started separating. And what's happening there is the treatments on DOL began in the midnight, about 1993, 94, the first treatments went in. So as those treatments started to accumulate, we saw this separation. And DOL about doubled their males per lek. Um, and it remained that way for about 15 years. And then in, in 2010, um, we had a really bad winter up there. And not only did we have a bad winter, but come spring, we had lots of snow during the nesting period. We had snow. So we had, we had hens on nests, and it was piling snow on top of us. That's not a good combination for successful nests. That happened again in 2011. And so we saw this big crash, not just on DOL, but all the populations crashed together. Now, DOL's rate of decline is more, but when you have more birds, uh, you're going to have a higher rate of decline as well. The graph on the right is just uh, it's a Beijing change point analysis. It's just looking at 
the probability that DLL populations were real changes. And, and you can see the increase was real, and the, the decrease in 2010 was also real. We, we also looked at brood count. Now, I was not able to include these in, into the REM paper, and the reason was is uh, the methodologies for counting the brutes were a little bit different, and so they wouldn't accept them as part of that paper. However, uh, those, the counts took place at the same. Um, the counts took place at the same time of year, in July and a little bit into early August, and, and no areas were double sampled. So I feel like the, the the chicks per brood is still a decent thing to look at. And basically, it's this area here that that the DLL wildlife manager went out and counted broods, and then uh, a DWR biologist counted broods on this BLM area uh, just north of, of DLL, okay? And when we look at their brood sizes, uh, DLL had about four chicks per brood on average, a little bit over that, and the BLM area had a little over two chicks per brood, so about twice the number of chicks on the DLL side in this time period from 97 to 2001. In my mind, and when you consider the importance of chick survival to sage grouse population dynamics, um, this matters, and, and in my mind was, was part of this picture of why DLL um, had such a response from their, from their grouse population. So, um, sagebrush treatments on DLL. Um, again, they were, they were putting in these treatments about 1.5% per year. It's important to note on this, on this graph down here, that most of the treatments were small. So they're in this less than 200 or 300 hectares. And here's an example in the picture. You can see this mosaic design, leaving sagebrush and taking sagebrush, okay? So also, not only were the treatments smaller on the landscape, but they happened in higher elevation. So most of them were over 2,000 feet and into 2,100 feet, or feet, meters. 2,000 meters and 2,100 meters elevation. What what this really means is the basin big stage communities start kind of occur in this range here between 2,000 and 2,100 meters. Once you get over 2,100 meters, you transition from basin big stage to mountain big stage, and you increase in in precipitation. Okay, and that's where most of those treatments were taking place. When we looked at the grouse use of these areas. Um, we looked at broods in intact stage brush, and we had reference areas that weren't treated, and then broods in treatment areas. And the, the number of broods in, in treatment areas far about doubled or more what we were finding in the intact stage brush. Not only that, but when we looked at distance to edge, it, it's a really similar story to Parker in that most of those broods were within 60 meters of an edge. Okay? Adults, we had um, a slightly more adults in treatment areas, but again, the birds that we found were used were using within that, about that 60 meters of an edge. So, from DLL, um, from our paper and, and this this project, again, this is a case study, not an experimental design. So, trying to tease out causal factors, me mechanisms of why these changes is not really possible be because of this case study format that we had to put things in. However, we had, based on the case study, we could say we had mixed results. We had, we had this potential positive effect that we saw in the mid-90s that was maintained until we had that bad weather. And once the bad weather hit, um, DLL crashed, as did the other, other populations. And so there is a caution there that there's, there's a chance, and we, we put this in the paper, we hypothesized that we may have treated too much sagebrush and started to hurt the birds uh, by doing too much. We don't know that for sure, but, but it's a possibility. And when you look at sage grouse literature in other areas, once you start removing nesting habitat and breeding habitat, uh, especially scrub cover, you, you hurt sage grouse populations. That, that's, that's very well documented. Um, however, few reported uh, or published cases show an increase in sage grouse populations, and we were able to show that. 
Um, I think that's important. Um, the, the story for most of the safety cost world is they're declining, they're declining, they're declining. And, and I think it's important to say where are they stable or increasing and what can we learn from those kind of places. Again, that mosaic treatment pattern is important. Um, what, I think once your treatment width goes beyond 120 meters, you're no longer benefiting drought. And I would include that for your intact sagebrush areas too, that you want, you want some room for the birds to get the cover that they need, as well as access to those forbs and grasses that are being increased uh, in, in your treatment area. Um, we, we have to throw out that caution that too much sagebrush treatment could be bad for grouse, especially when you're in that in those nesting zones. Okay, and 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 I would include that for winter as well. In fact, in in winter, it's really hard to justify sagebrush treatment in wintering habitat at all for for sagebrush. We also have to think about legacy effects. So what we, the data we reported in this uh, study was data just from those years of 1989 to 2013. What we did report, but what happened on the landscape is large sagebrush removal projects were done in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And, and now those, a lot of those happened at lower elevations in our Wyoming sagebrush habitat in, in, in where the birds winter. And so the birds are wintering in, in crested wheatgrass stands that have some sagebrush that have come back in. But certainly those stands would be different if they had never been treated and, and would have more safer cover in them. And so you, you, stuff that happened in the 60s could be hurting grouse now, if, you know, with, with, with certain weather conditions and that kind of thing. You have to consider that. Um, sagebrush recovery needs to match treatment rates. So if, if you're in a Wyoming stand, it may be 30 or 40 years if you treat that before it comes back. And so your, your treatment rate on that spatial and temporal scales should match, should be matching that, right? Whereas, like on Parker Mountain, we, we're getting brushed back within 10 years um, in our mechanical treatment. And so the treatment rate and, and scale at which we treat could, could change to match those, those recovery rates. And lastly, you know, how, how is a treatment going to benefit sage grouse. It's probably through this nutritional pathway, right? You're increasing the forbs that are available to the grouse and, and possibly the insects that are associated with those forbs. That's, that's this nutritional idea. But that has to be balanced against negative habitat or cover effects on the bird, and, and you need to be thinking about that. So let's talk a little bit about the guidelines um, that are still being used. Uh, in, in our policy, both in federal and state agencies. And, and it, it's important to, to talk about kind of their recommendations because it matters when it comes to treating sagebrush. Um, I think one of, one of the issues we have with the guidelines is this. They're treated uh, largely by the sagebrush conservation community as if they were handed down at the commandment. And they're not. Um, they're not that at all. And, and we have to be careful with that. Um, as we move forward. In fact, the, the guidelines themselves, if, if you read, read them, you'll notice that they talk about the need for local information and that, that if you have good local information on your populations and, and the habitats they're using, that should trump any data that they're um, uh, purporting in, in the guidelines. And, and that idea is largely ignored in, in our policy and our resource management plan. And, and I think we need to um, do our best to, to look at the local data where we have it. So when it comes to treatment of sagebrush and the guidelines, when we're looking at different seasonal habitat types, this is what the guidelines say. In your breeding habitat, in your nesting and early breeding habitat, you, you need to maintain 80% of those habitats for a population. For brood rearing, and, and really what this refers to is late brood rearing, kind of that um, late June, July, August period, you need to maintain 40% of, of your habitat. And for winter, again, you're back up to 80, maintaining 80%. Um, so as you're designing projects, are we fitting spatially? Are we fitting within these? Right? Now, 
it's important to know this these numbers are the best projection or I'm not going to say guess, but the best opinion of the experts that wrote the guidelines. There is no scientific evaluation that supports those percentages. It's not to my knowledge. It's not out there. And so we we have to understand that, that, that we're still dealing inside these percentages with somebody's best guess. Okay? Now, for instance, my opinion as, as working with Sage Krause as long as I have now, I would want to maintain more than 40% of my broodery habitat. In fact, I would be up in the 60 plus percent if it was if they made me Sage Grouse King for a day and I could I could have my way. So just just be thinking about that. Um, I, I cannot overemphasize when you're dealing with sage brush treatment and, and trying to justify treatment, you have to understand seasonal habitat types. Okay? So let's talk about how you might justify a sage brush treatment for sage grouse. Do you know the limiting factor in your population? And could that could a treatment help address that limiting factor? So for instance, if, if, if nest success and survival was your limiting factor, how I can't see how you would justify treating sage brush to help that situation out. However, if your limiting factor was chick survival and you had less than optimal fork cover, then maybe treatment of sagebrush becomes an option. Okay? So, so think about that. Um, is fork cover or diversity an issue in, in, in the place that you're working? Um, if it's not, then maybe treatment uh, shouldn't be considered. And, and, and you, need to, you need to think about that. Can you define your, your population seasonal habitat? Could, can you draw those lines within the areas you're working? If you can't draw those lines, you're at risk of, of hurting the bird. And your probability of maximizing that certainty that you're going to help the birds is, is really gray. It's really shaded at that point. If you cannot understand your, your population seasonal habitat use, and are they a migratory population? Are they migratory elevationally? Do they move between seasonal habitats? Or do they use the same area for their seasonal habitat? And if they do, which most of the populations I've worked with, there's at least some overlap between seasonal habitat types. That's where you got to be careful and very prescriptive on, on how you're going to do treatment. Um, can you focus on late brooding habitat? And if, if you can, if you know that there are certain areas the birds are going to, that for late brood rain, that becomes, I think, the, the most justifiable place to do stage brush treatment and increase forage for livestock. It's in that seasonal habitat type. And, and if that is separate from your breeding or wintering habitat. Can you ensure you're minimizing the effects on breeding and especially winter habitat? And you provide for a mosaic design. Now, as I work with producers, providing for a mosaic design is not the most efficient way to treat an area for sagebrush. It's just not. Um, but there's, there's a big difference between, let's say I have 10,000 acres of late brooding habitat, and so I'm going to treat 20% of it, of 2,000 acres. There's a big difference to the bird if you're going to treat a block of 2,000 acres, or if you're going to do a big mosaic of 2,000 acres. There's, there's going to be a huge difference to the bird based on the data that we have. So, so be thinking about that. Um, I think this is an important question to ask yourself as, as you're helping your, the producers. And I understand the producers have their perspective, and, and, and they need we, we need to find mutually beneficial um, management practices, and, and, and that's how we're going to move sage grouse conservation forward. But we need to ask the question, what would happen if you left it alone? <coughs> and, and is that the best thing for the bird? And, and Because while you're there working with a producer, you're also you're doing this for the bird, and, and we, we need to think about that. 
Bottom line, can you maximize the probability of a positive impact for the graph? That's your bottom line. I do want to talk about this one exception to winter habitat where I think we need to rethink things a little bit, and that's in, that's in wintering habitat where we've lost our perennial grasses and it's invaded by cheatgrass or medusa head or, or some other um, uh, non-native grass that, that's troublesome. Okay? So I'm, I'm talking about this right here. Um, when, when we look at these kind of communities, and, and we have them here in Utah, um, I, I see them all over the place in the Great Basin especially, what are we going to do here? So if we're looking at the short term, you know, the, the five-year mark, is, is this sage grouse winter habitat? Yes, it is. Um, the probability of that being gone in a five-year window is pretty low, that it's going to remain winter habitat for sage grouse. But let's go to 30 years. When I look at this right here, in 30 years, what's the probability that's going to still be there in 30 years? It's a lot lower in that 30-year window. And, and I think that's where we need to think about sage grouse conservation and, and what's the time scale that we want to look at. And, and I'm certainly more interested in that long term than the short term if we can balance those two. And, and we need restoration in this situation, and, and that's only going to take place through sagebrush treatment and getting a perennial grass back into the system. And, and it may, in, in this case, it would probably take some plateau to help you along the way to control your cheatgrass. Um, and so, well, honestly, the science behind this kind of restoration of this kind of system isn't there yet. I, I, I don't think we really understand how to restore this, but, you know, we're, we're continually learning how to do that. Um, but, but in this case is where I think we need to we need to think a little bit outside the box of the guidelines where you know we're thinking 20 percent and that kind of thing and I think we need to think about some more some bigger landscape stuff uh, to restore store these kind of systems in the long term for sage crop. And with that, I think we can take some questions. That was great. Thanks so much. Do we have any uh, any questions? You can either type them in the dialog box on the webinar, um, or just go ahead and shout them out here. I know there's got to be questions. I'll call on people if I have to. <laughs> yeah, this is Lars over in Oregon. Um, I had a question on the first part of your presentation. It seemed like something happened in 2005. And a lot of those graphs seem to have a kind of a boost in production, both in your controls as well as your treatments. Just curious what happened in 2005. Yeah, that was a wet year. Um, we had we had a good snowpack and a pretty good spring. Uh, 2006 was a much drier year. So, you know, that understory is going to change uh, based on your annual precip. Uh, but, but like and you pointed out, the control responded as well. And so, uh, I mean, that's, that's our comparison, right, is that in reference to the control. Hey, Dave, this is Taylor. Hey, Taylor. I was wondering if... Uh, so we've seen some preferential use by livestock using our GPS collars on Deseret. I was wondering in the future if that information will be found, that the sage grouse will be using that those treatment areas in the future like the cows have been seen to do, and if that will be sort of like an amendment with this paper um, in our grazing studies and, and uh, show the correlation between the two. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right, Taylor. I think uh, if if the so we have that, Taylor knows this. Not everybody else knows this. We have radio mark uh, grouse with GPS on Deseret right now, so we're continuing uh, to monitor. We've also had VHF on on birds on DLL for the last four years. So yeah, we will look into that in the future. If they're doing what the rest of the birds we've monitored, it'll show a preference for treatment areas. 
and I, w- I would expect that. Um, the the other update to this to that story, the DLL story in that paper would be as so so what what's not in those let count graphs is what's happened the last three years since about 2012, or well, four years now, and that's that's a major upswing in the population. So as that population continues to grow in rich, are the DLL LECs going to grow at a faster rate than the other two study areas? And that would be, that, that's my question based on, on the past, and, and, and we, we can look at that in the future. Right now, I would expect that um, based on what we've seen in the past. A couple other questions there in the, in the chat, Dave. I don't know if you can see those or not. Yeah, I, I got them. So, um, any thoughts on research or research on fire effects compared to other treatments? Um, we did on the well. I shouldn't say that. So on on Parker, we did not do any fire uh, stuff. On DLL, there were some small uh, treatments with fire at higher elevations, but they were not monitored um, with with bird dogs for the grouse count. So. We don't understand that for DLL. I was part of a project on Anthro Mountain out out in uh, kind of eastern Utah, where we we used fire, and we uh, this is part of Dr. Thacker's uh, dissertation, and he showed stronger use, more use by broods um, and, and grouse in general on small mosaic fires. Um, in that area, so so they those fires m- mimic um, m- mimic kind of what we saw in the in the spike treatments or the and, and that kind of thing, rather than a large scale fire. So they they really designed them for for that more mosaic. Um, I think the only place you can really talk about fire for grouse right now, based on the research we have, is in those higher elevation mountain big sagebrush zones. Which anthro was? Um, I, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna talk about um, fire in, in Wyoming sagebrush, uh, you're gonna have a hard time uh, uh, justifying that for grouse. And there's 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 research out there showing that. A- any other thing about fire that we're on it? Okay. Um, the next question in, in high elevation mountain sagebrush sites. That are not in sagegrass winter range. What can or should be done in areas of dense sagebrush with little to no remaining grass and forb under story? Would you need to reseed following treatment, or would it uh, be best to not treat these areas at all? Um, that that's exactly the case that we had on Parker Mountain. So we had non-wintering habitat at high elevations with very dense mountain sagebrush. Um, canopy cover, uh, and I didn't mention this, but our pretreatment cover for mountain big sagebrush was in that 30 to 40 percent, which is very high, and and we assume was limiting that grass and forb understory. Um, what's, what's interesting is we did not reseed after spike. So we had enough seed base in that community to respond like, like I talked about with those grass forbs and more succulent forbs. Um, without seeding. The only plots that got seeded in that experiment were our Dixie plots, but it was it was a drought year, that, that first year post-treatment, that first growing season post-treatment, and we saw no uh, response from our seeded species. So we basically, it, 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 it's as if we never seeded, and, and that, that stayed true through the rest of our vegetation sampling. On, on DLL, some of their areas they seeded, some of their areas they didn't. Uh, a lot of their, when they dissed sagebrush areas, they reseeded, um, and, and, and they saw a response uh, from their seed, and, and grouse were using those seeded areas. So but this was at lower elevations in that basin big stage, um, and, and I think uh, there may be some uh, appropriate seeding that you could do there. Well, great. Thank you all, and, and thanks to Dr. Aldrin for, for your time and uh, your expertise.
piece on the topic. That brings us to the end of our call here. I'll take a second to plug Utah State's upcoming conference uh, in Salt Lake City, February 23rd through 26th. Uh, sagebrush ecosystem conference all all hands all land um, I think there will be I know there will be at least half a dozen or so um, SGI folks in attendance and so that might be a great opportunity to follow up um, I know Dr. Dalvin will probably be pretty busy running around but maybe a chance to grab him in the hallway or at a social um, and pick his brain a little bit more so and if you're not registered for that meeting to be there in person you can also view it um, remotely, which I know a number of you guys are already doing. So um, if that interests you, it looks like it's going to be a good conference, lots of technical resources, and so uh, feel free to look into that uh, between now and, again, the 23rd through 26th of February. So with that, uh, Dr. Dahlgren, thanks so much. I think that was really valuable, and uh, we'll talk to you all later. Thanks. Thank you.